Test, test, test. Test, test, test. Test, test, test. Oh, it's it's not it's yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't play. It's not that it matters. I mean, that comes back. I don't know about you. You got to save your vocal cords. <laughs> no, it's a tender voice. Voice. You're definitely not one to talk. <laughs> it's his nighttime voice. Test. Hello. Test, test, test. Yeah, on. Test, 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 test. Test, test, test. Okay. All right. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll just roll with it. If it gets fixed, cool. If not, no big deal. All right. Hey, guys. I don't know if the speaker is working out there, so we'll just talk really loud. Sorry about that. We'll try to talk loud. Uh, this is a talk that we just finally named right before this called Red Teaming the Trap House. This is actually a little bit of a background on this. This is an extended version of a talk we did at DerbyCon that was called The Trap House, Making Your House as Paranoid as You Are. We've actually added a lot more stuff to it because we kind of realized a while back that we were going back and forth on talks that were essentially red teaming or blue teaming a modern home. So, I'm Dave. This is Jonathan. We, uh, we have... Wrong meeting. Um, we both got a bunch of certs and all that fun stuff. We both work at a place called ReliQuest in Tampa. We do manage sock services, a bunch of engineering, if you need any of that, or if you're looking for a job, we are hiring, yada, yada, yada. So now, uh, right. so uh, how this whole thing started to come around is that I made the unfortunate mistake of buying Philips Hue light bulbs. And if you know anything about Philips Hue light bulbs, they are literally crack, right? But the problem is, is that I'm in the InfoSec industry and that tends to make me extremely paranoid, especially when you start talking about IoT devices. So I started to think, how can we use these home automation systems in order to not only make our lives easier and cooler, but can, they, can we make our lives more secure? Or my, can I make my home more secure by repurposing these systems? So the, the basic, uh, uh, approach to this concept is that all devices should be repurposed, right? Hey, if I have motion sensors that trigger my light, there's no reason I can't use these same motion sensors to detect motion inside my house when I'm not home. Um, so another example is like smart speakers. Think of your Google Home. That can totally double as a siren, right? If you have speakers placed all around your house, why shouldn't you use that in order to broadcast an alert? Um, the problem with that is that you need to have some kind of approach to centralize all of these different components. Philips has their own Hue ecosystem. You know, Samsung has a SmartThings ecosystem. Google Home and Amazon have their own APIs for able to access these things. So you need some kind of central platform to manage all of these. And Wink, right. But the thing is, is that none of them really integrate nicely with each other. You know, Wink only supports certain protocols and, and things. And you know you can't, you don't have the extensibility of of setting up really complex integrations with them. So I did a lot of discovery, and the platform that I settled on was Home Assistant. This is probably my favorite of all of the platforms that I was playing around with. Home Assistant can literally integrate with anything. It's ridiculously easy to set up. I run it on a Raspberry Pi three, um, and it's stupidly easy and the advantage with it is that I can repurpose any of these devices. Sure, they can s completely serve their own normal function, but I can repurpose them. So this is a um, this is kind of what the home assistant interface looks like. Um, so you can see here you've got the nav on the left hand side and then I've got these I've got different zones set up for all of the different devices in there. So I have a garage sensor in the, or a motion sensor in the garage, and whether or not the motion is activated, you know, that's, that switches from a zero to a one. Device tracking for all of the different devices that are normally identified on the network. Um, and then just different management things for, for the lights. I built a really ghetto floor plan with a, a custom SVG editor, but you can kind of get the idea of how you can 
separate your rooms into different zones and then just have different things, um, you know, have, have that change out. So to talk about the different components, um, and kind of get an idea of what the cost of something like this would be, start out with the centralized brain, right? Raspberry Pi Model 3, maybe $35, you can maybe add an extra $20 for the SD card. Um, my Philips Hue light bulbs, which I've spent a ridiculous amount of money on, motion sensors, um, and you know, the, the use case there was that, hey, I wanna walk into a room without having to touch a light, let's also use this as motion sensors for the home security. And then, you know, assorted Google Homes or Amazon Echoes so that you can, you know, walk anywhere in, into the room and have Martin, Martin Gabe turn on. So for a 1600 foot square house, this is about, you know, what you, you might run. Cheap, better, best, um, and really it just depends on what kind of lights do you want in, what kind of speakers do you want. But the goal is, is that anything you set up, as long as it has APIs and integrations, you can use whatever. For notifications, I use pushover, $5 for a device type, really simple. So there's a few core principles for building your own IoT security system. And number one is that you need your CFO buy-in. That's your significant other. They need to be bought into this because <laughs> no one else is, go is gonna be happy about this. And it, the, the prices tend to add up quick, but when you say, honey, don't worry, we can use this for multiple things. Yeah, that might not work, but still. So easy to manage, right? You need to be able to access this remotely. Um, you need to be able to quickly view and manage the status through a mobile device. I'm not gonna sit there and teach someone how to SSH to a Raspberry Pi and restart the services, right? There's, there's really no point in that. So the simpler you can make the management of, of th this um, platform, the better. Support sending of notifications. I shouldn't, you know, if someone's breaking into my house, I should be able to see that on my phone while I'm at work, right? There's no reason I need to be on the same network in order to get that notification. Um, be aware of people inside the home. And, you know, c this is kind of touches on the principle of presence detection. Can, how, what can we do to identify whether or not someone that's normally and expected to be inside the house is home or someone that's not expected to be inside, inside the house. Have an audible siren. You know, that, uh, just because I know someone's in the house, that doesn't mean that my neighbor knows that someone's in the house. But once all the noise starts to happen, then they might know. And then again, that goes back to that CFO buy-in. If, if it's not easy enough for everyone in the house to use, it will just not evolve the way you want it to go. So his crack is Philips Hue bulbs. My crack is this stuff. Um, if you're in the hands-on workstation stuff, they've got some SDR things. Don't do it. Because you'll go and you'll play with it. You'll be like, oh, this little SDR thing is only 20, 30 bucks or something. It, that's what starts. That's that free hit of crack, and then you're just downhill from there. So back on to presence detection. We'll get into how we use this. You guys probably guessed half of what we're going to talk about. But the easiest way of presence detection devices and thing is through RF of Jones, different types. So kind of the cheaper, better, best option for detecting stuff to keep from all this. This is the cheap and easy one. Use the Wi-Fi inside of your device. Use the Bluetooth attached to your device. And then just go get a cheapo, rgl.sdr.com. Um, you can find sometimes cheaper radios than that even, but these guys run a great website. They put a great product out. So that's really recommended. They do lots of tests with their devices to make this more stable than some of the like $20 stuff you can get off of eBay. Uh, slightly better if you want to throw in for a TP-Link WN 7022N, a little bit better distance for Wi-Fi stuff. It is only 802.11 B, so you won't, you won't get the uh, 5 gigahertz one if you're playing more. So it's great, removable antenna, so you can stick another antenna on there if you want. And if you want to spend a little bit more money, these little SEMA Bluetooth adapters are fantastic. Again, it's one of the rare Bluetooth adapters you can find with this antenna port, so that's super popular. That's just a little Christmas shell. If you want to start getting really crazy, this is what I would personally recommend. I believe I updated the final cost there because I ended up adding the yardstick one, but things added there would be a cheapo PICP2531, which is a Zigbee USB dongle. It's receive only. Uh, like I say, you can find $8 Chinese clones on eBay, which I'd recommend. Only real difference I can see is they use a lot brighter LED, which I don't get. Two Bluetooth one for all your Bluetooth needs, the SDR again, then the yardstick one. The yardstick one is Michael Osterman, the guy who does the Gigahertz Mac RF sub gigahertz radio based on like the Zigbee 1 and 1 chip. Uh, it runs code called 
RF gap, you guys may have heard of a guy named Alex Rafine did, which basically is Python ladders do a lot of fun stuff for things under a gigabit. And then once you just firmly embrace that you're addicted and you have no choice, um, here's some other great stuff. There's the AirSpy Mini, which is a great little mini SDR for 99 bucks. Uh, the AMP 500 antenna, flexible antenna, very useful in a small fix you had. PacRF already mentioned. Lime SDR Mini is coming out soon, which is actually two full duplex radios and a fairly large dongle size device, but it fits in your bag quite nicely. And I apologize for talking as fast as I am, but we have a lot of stuff. So as far as cases and joint, right? Um, and ag again, you know, this talk is intended for both sides of this. Think of this both as an attacker and as the homeowner of a, the trap house, if you will, right? So if I'm looking at the house, as a modern day thief, what kind of things am I going to be looking at? And what makes a particular home a good target? Obviously, the first thing that I'm going to look for as a thief is, are there valuables inside the home? The, va the cost of the valuables that I'm going to then spend, I need to be able to offset the cost of me going to jail and paying a lawyer and buying bail and you know, going through all that fun jazz. Um, when would be the best time to break in? I wouldn't necessarily break into a house at 2 a.m. because all of the neighbors are probably home. If I can see that a house has very low activity at around 3 p.m. and none of the other neighbors are home because they're also at work, then hey, that might be a, that might make a particular home a better target. Is there an alarm system present? Right? Does this house have like a you know sign in the front of the yard protected by X Y Z security? Um, that tends to kind of you know whether or not the house actually has an alarm that that it does actually produce harm for a thief. So. These are some of the questions that an attacker will be looking at to hopefully actually be smoke around your face, around your home. So as far as how to actually detect stuff, um, you have to understand that a lot of electronics leak a lot of information. I mean, look, think about the, the cell phones, right? All the networks get connected to, they all leak Wi-Fi code. All your Bluetooth interfaces. Hey, there's tons of tools for that. Use Blue Hydra, use Web, which is actually really good for LA. Um, Zig, there's a, you can capture Zigbee traffic with a application called Killer Bees, and Z-Wave traffic with an application called Killer Z. Killer Bees and Killer Z are awesome, awesome projects. It's a fun one to get hard. Now, the harder part about doing all of this is that you know you can collect a lot of the information out of the air, but how do you narrow that down to the specific homes of that you went that I'm showing? So, an idea of some of the stuff that you'd want to you'd want to detect, right? Think about how pricey they are. TVs, especially nowadays with a uh, high proliferation of smart TVs, they leak a lot of information. Game systems, Xbox system dishes, um, any infrastructure. So start looking at the infrastructure that the house is, is, is broadcasting. For example, if I start seeing a lot of Zigbee traffic inside a house and they correspond with Scope Two light bulbs, then we know that the person inside probably has an affinity for buying up with a lot more of expensive electronics, which makes that home a better target for me as an attacker. Does that make sense? And then miscellaneous stuff. Um, if they have like, you know, these, these smart beds, smart toothbrushes, Fitbit, water bottles, that all kind of says a lot about the people inside the house and how much money that they're spending on things that I can easily resell as an attacker. So again, if we can infer if the, the house has a high cost of electronic devices, then there's probably more expensive individually valuable items have the money to spend on electronics, they might have the money to spend on jewelry or you know, guns or other things that, that I would be interested in. So knowing you have the right target and narrowing all this down, um, there's a lot of OSM that you could probably do to go around and do it, right? If you can cross-reference the address with the name of the person who's visiting the house, maybe their Wi-Fi network might give them some hints. You know, if this is Johnson's Wi-Fi, then that's probably a good indication that Johnson lives there, right? Um, tailor your target. We collect Wi-Fi probes and cross-reference that with Wiggle, and you know, cross-reference that the location that they're at, and see if you can match that up to the home. Right? Follow them to work. Start collecting their probes. Stay behind them a little bit. Um, once you know the SSID, start collecting MAC addresses for your probes. Most of the devices are going to be from like software and onboarding codes that you guys know if you do Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. But typically, Bluetooth with the MAC address is going to be about. definitely want to limit the amount of information that you're collecting. So if you're looking at a neighborhood and you have three houses right next to each other, instead of using some big, big, corny string of Yagis, use a directional antenna so that you can limit just to your specific target. 
this is just going over some examples of stuff people might see. I did this because a lot of times I found people just look at Wi-Fi access points and don't really put much thought into it. So some examples, like the top set there, you wouldn't be interested in if you're trying to break into a house because the last couple are clear. These are all cars and the middle one's a bus, so not too helpful. Uh, the middle one, second one's there, those are actually ones that are connectable to a service provider. So while that's probably not necessarily helpful, depending on narrowing down, you can sometimes maybe know someone where they are from geography-wise. Like say, you know, BHN Secure obviously is Bright House Networks, and if you're in, say, New York and see that, probably it's not someone who's local. Next one obviously is hotels. That makes you know that maybe they travel a lot. And then the last one there is, again, some other more corporate or larger scale access points. So you probably wouldn't want to attack those, like the ruckus and the ubiquity. Uh, some Bluetooth examples. This is helpful both for if you're trying to attack someone or you're just trying to, to detect someone itself. These are pretty obvious what they are, like Nintendos and stuff like that. But then if you're actually trying to detect someone from outside, this is also helpful because, for example, the Scala Rider ones, those are headsets for motorcycles. So you may be detecting someone actually outside of your home at the time if you don't normally see that. But if you just kind of look at all this information, put a little thought into it, you can really read a lot more info out of it. And another suggestion we've had actually in the past is you may even want to record the MAC addresses of your devices as almost a secondary serial number in case your stuff's ever stolen. Can't hurt. So that kind of goes on to my next few examples. Like you can, you, as a red, you, you, uh, you get a listing of the devices that are inside the house. But as blue, suddenly you have, you're able to collect all of the devices that are inside your house and have an asset inventory of them based on their MAC address. Some more examples, like we said, as he mentioned, if you see like a lot of Zigbee, you know someone's probably into a lot of home automation and you can pretty much assume they've got some money to blow. So Killer Bees, excellent program, uh, lets you see devices in there, you, you basically stumble across it. This is a snippet of some stuff that we found in one home that's a bunch of automated lights. Z-Wave, while most people think it's probably the same as Zigbee, it's a lower frequency, slightly different, but you usually find it typically more in industrial stuff, but starting to get used more in homes. Again, this is actually an alert from a door sensor opening and closing that we recorded. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. So presence detection. Um, scoping out a house, kind of, how do I know whether or not people are home? Because if I break into a house and people are home, this goes from burglary to armed robbery, kidnapping, and I suddenly am looking at a lot more years behind bars. Um, so the, it's important that when I break into this home that no one's home. That being said, to flip that around, managing my own you know, internal IoT network, it's important to know whenever people are home that are you know, normal users of this so that I can set certain schedules and have certain actions trigger. Like let's say whenever I come home, I have my Google Home welcome me and cuss at me and tell me what a terrible person I am. But they do say welcome home, which is important, right? But I don't want that message to play when my significant other comes home, because if the Google Homes are yelling at her, then it's not going to be pretty. Um, so my point is, presence detection is extremely difficult. Um, if we rely on motion detection, it's already too late from a defensive standpoint, right? Because at that point, you're looking at host compromise. At the same time, a motion detector doesn't necessarily differentiate between individuals. It just says, someone is here. I don't know who that someone is, but someone's here. A typical home intruder will probably have a cell phone on them. Like, let's think about the sophistication of the people that are breaking in your house. They probably parked in your driveway, they probably brought their cell phone in with them, and they probably are broadcasting SSID probes, they're probably broadcasting Bluetooth probes, and if you're collecting all of that information, that's something that's gonna be useful for later. So as far as Oh, do you want to talk on both of them? Yeah, that's, that's another one you can use. Obviously, they have their apps themselves. You can also work that into the home automation that you have. That's the great part about those package views built in early. Uh, so how to detect people? I threw together some scripts that basically work on top of a program called Woods by Tim Cohn. Essentially, all you really need to do is the stuff that we have is the stuff I mentioned earlier, mostly Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. Um, I forgot that was even in there. That probably should have been removed. We'll forget that one. 
Uh, the goal of breadcrumbs lets you set up people to track where it can alert on if you see a probe for a certain network or a certain MAC address. It can also do this for Bluetooth stuff as well. Uh, I ended up just using Blue Hydra, another program for the Bluetooth stuff, because it was a lot faster than the code I had written. Another thing I had for a while there just for giggles because people get paranoid about cells getting intercepted is I actually have a monitoring local cell towers. Just it will alert if a new one pops up or something's changed like that. Nothing's happened, but hey, we live in boring times, I guess. So as mentioned, breadcrumbs basically WUDs and Blue Hydra to collect Bluetooth and Wi-Fi probes. The origination of this really comes down to a few years ago, Jonathan and I had a boss who was actually based out of Canada. And you know, normally that's fantastic when your boss is in a different country. You want him to work whenever the hell you want. It's delightful. But then we kept showing up and boom, he'd be there. It's like, oh, son of a bitch. So we were like, we got to figure out some way to find this out. So that's why I ended up digging into this. And it kind of exploded into having a web interface that shows you updates, stats. So <laughs> you know how that goes. Um, I'll update the GitHub with this newer version. But literally, we wrote this at first to get an alert. So on our drive-in, we knew if our boss was sitting in the office at the time waiting for us. That's the complete reason we did this. Um, in context of this, so as far as uh, actually detecting people using using this, I mean, it, it goes back to as an attacker, I don't want to tie anyone up, and in the sa at the same time, I can use these exact same techniques to identify whether or not neighbors are home as well, right? If I take an inventory of all the devices that are there at say midnight, and then compare that to an inventory of all the devices that are there at say 3 p.m., anything that's missing may or may not be in indicative of a, of a neighbor. Um, and this is really fairly simple to do. I mean, we've all done different aspects of this, I'm sure. Um, but it's just a matter of combining this all and using it to, and abusing it to get more context. Um, and then that kind of goes back to different ways to detect general house uses and patterns. If we don't want to just rely on Wi-Fi, there's some other techniques that we can do for this. So one thing that we found that was kind of fun is a lot of environments nowadays, homes, residences, whatnot, have connected power, which means it could either be a device that sends out information about your power usage so your power company can just drive by and collect that information, or there's also more modern ones that are getting rolled out in some environments that are two-way that then have abilities for you to track your power yourself, turn off and on certain things. So AMI started really surprisingly long time ago. It was, like I said, made for drive-by meter readings. A lot of, I always thought that that's probably just to keep costs down for the electric company. Their statement was a lot of times meters were in places like behind fences where there may be dogs or cars for you to get access to it. And that results in those estimated bills that eventually get reset and maybe you get a crazy huge bill. So AMI, AMR is the one way. AMI is the two way. Again, remote power management, alarms, leak detection. Uh, that's starting to get rolled out over in Tampa. I honestly am not sure if you're in Orlando in your own area. So, of course, you know, we're still in Florida. We went, they rolled this out in about 2013. They did a bunch of public health studies. The Public Service Corporation is the arm of our government that deals with this stuff. A bunch of companies and utilities came in, presented on health impacts and costs and everything, and everything was great. And this is if you go to the Public Service Corporation right now, this is what's on their page. Talking about the data there, trying to keep people from getting scared about it. So to me, the interesting ones was these. They basically say smart meter data is, is not sending out any custom identifiable info, and it's encrypted and sent in a way that only the utility company can read that. There's a few variations on it, but it's always only the utility company can read that. I'm not sure if that's really correct. At the very least with AMR, anyone with one of these $20, $25 RTL SDRs can pick up everything. This is actual data that I picked up, as you see, a little before Christmas last year from around my house. And I'm in a multi-story townhouse, so if I go up high and put an antenna, I get a couple hundred of these. So I'm getting power meter readings even at night, which is something I've never seen. So the main company that makes these power meters basically say, yeah, the data's there, but it's only what you would see if you went and actually read the meter. So my thought on that was, well, what if you could read the meter every 10 to 15 seconds? What kind of information would that be? As for personal identifiable information, if you just walk by the meter once, you can usually see the meter ID, the type, and the model. Model's not helpful for what we're doing, but walk by someone's house once, get that meter ID, and you get that information and do the consumption rate. Okay, so what necessarily does that give us? So I picked a random target, I don't know who they were near my house, and tracked their power usage for a few days, and then just mapped it, because obviously when someone's in the home, more things will be turned on, so more power will be getting used to it. 
clever, this map gets to show me very simply when it went offline. So if I was a bad guy, what could I look at this data and possibly use it for? I know when I can break in. Apparently this person's not around very much. Now, so. so that moves on to other stuff. Not getting busted. And this is detecting people detecting you. This will be quick because you guys probably read about this. Uh, IOactive did some information on the Simply Safe. It's the ticket yourself kind of like home install alarm. They found a lot of issues with this alarm system. A lot of replay stuff was there. Um, they actually found out about this by someone posting this onto their user blog. And they responded back, and they're like, well, you know, it's very unlikely, it's highly sophisticated, these guys did, you know, pull these things to Ellison, pull the firmware off, it did a lot of stuff that average, you know, bad guy caught up with Robbie probably wouldn't do. Uh, they're saying they haven't reported, got any reports of anyone attempting these attacks, uh, not aware of it happening or anything, and other people use the same security. What interested me was a comment they put in the fire to that, saying that hackers have to know if you have anything worth stealing. Obviously, from what we've already been covering, there's multiple, multiple ways of dealing with that. So, and also about the whole thing with it being really hard, Mike Austin again, if you guys don't know who that is, go read this one. He's a smart guy, amazing at SPR stuff. He basically redid all these attacks to the point at the end of the strike like in 10 minutes or something, engaged the alarm. This is yardstick one. So $99 from some Python code that he was turning these things off remotely. He dug into it big time, figuring out how it worked, and everything worked. It wasn't majorly hard. So my thought was, is Okay, how hard is that to do with other stuff? So obviously if you know what frequency you should look at, and the question may be if you're looking to debug a device or sniff it, how do you know what frequency is at? Because if you just bring up something and start scanning these everywhere, hard to nail it down. It's one of the rare times the SEC is just right, especially right now. But um, they have everything available. Every manufacturer, if it puts out any sort of frequency, they've got to run it through a gauntlet of tests with the FCC. They've got to document all this stuff up and down, and it's all public information. It, the SEC's way of putting it out there is a little rough, but someone threw together this site, FCCID.io. It's not the SEC site. They're making some money on some stupid ads on there, but it's fantastic for making this information on whatever device you have. And the level of detail you can get from this, like they have it down to gut shots in most cases, these crazy pictures of the test environments they had to put up. They'll show you the different frequency ranges each device is hitting everything. So. Essentially, if you can figure out what type of alarm system, like Jonathan mentioned, if they have the sign out there, you can usually then figure out what type of devices are going to be there, what equipment such as this Honeywell they would use, and then just go onto this site and find what you're looking for. So we actually picked up one of the motion sensors just to play with it, found the frequency we found, and well, without getting as smart as Mike Austin, we brought it up and walked in front of it and looked, and it just starts pinging out. So you see it sending some information that it sees the motion. And this is not even tied to anything yet, so this is just it using it. So you, it's not encrypted, it's not hidden, it's on the frequency itself. If you want to get really insane, this is a great tool called Universal Radio Hacker that lets you record stuff and then try to actually musk a bit and figure out what's there. But the problem here is we didn't even really need to do this because we see exactly whenever someone's moving. So we could tune into motion sensors at someone's home and see if you're seeing any activity and know if it's moving. Mind you, this could be someone's house or dog, but. So that was a little bit of an older system. And this, I'll throw this to John. This is the story of us two nights ago getting together at his place to finish up these guys. It took a while, so I had to come and record today. And he recently bought some toys to work on, and he went down and found this stuff. And I'm sure he's talking about it. It's, uh, it's funny because someone actually just mentioned the Wink Lookout. Um, I, I did buy a Wink Lookout, and I was like, oh, hey, maybe I can start integrating these different things, because what I was missing was store sensors, and I needed, you know, I, was, I wanted sensors to notify me every time the door opened and every time the door closed so that I could monitor the state of the doors. So some wireless alarms can be detected and bypassed, and we found this out the hard way. Um, usually these types of things are going to be self-install kits. I mean, you can pick them up. Simply Safe has them, Wink has them. There's a lot of different ones that exist. Um, but the more commercially installed systems, say one that ADT would put out, instead of, uh, they're moving a lot more recently towards wireless systems just because it's easier for them to set up. They don't have to run telephone wire all around your house. And, you know, it's, so it's really easy to do. So going off of IoT alarms, um, like I said, I bought a Wink Lookout. I was really excited for it. Released in 2007, it actually got released in, I think, October, so this is fairly new. 
Um, I think it sells for, I think I bought it for maybe 100, 150, I don't recall. Uh, but basically it comes with two door sensors, a motion sensor and a siren. Uh, Wink operates entirely on Z-Wave and it comes with a hub that you set up and then you can talk to all the different devices. Um, now Z-Wave is on 800 to 900 megahertz. So we looked at the system and tried to figure out whether or not it's vulnerable in the same way. Using the, um, Killer, Killer Z, we were able to capture some of the packets for, for different actions that were happening on here. So every time we opened the front door, you can see that we captured here and there's three separate um, Z-Wave packets that are being broadcasted. You keep capturing these over and over again and none of the data is actually changing. Did the same thing for capturing the actual closed door. Now, Killer Z and Killer B both have really nice features where you can actually replay these packets if you have a Z-Wave device. I think this is the, um, yeah, the Yardstick one does work for transmitting these packets as well. And it works very, very well. So you can actually spoof opening a door, right? Let's say that you keep replaying this over and over and over and over again, and you can kind of mess with the state of the ap actual application itself. So you see on the right that I have my mobile app here. The door was closed, and I'm sitting there at my desk, and then suddenly I get a notification that my front door opens, and you know I run down and try to check it out, but nothing's going on. The door is closed. But my phone clearly says that the door is open. Now imagine that you're going to work, you open your door, you close your door, you start walking out, and then you get a notification that your door got open. Well, I gotta run to work, so I might spend maybe 30 seconds debugging this, open the door, close the door, you get another notification that your door's open. All right, I don't have the time to deal with, with this right now, so I'm just gonna go ahead and go to work. Now, we can also spoof closed door notifications as well, right? So what we discovered is that you can actually, by sending these replay attacks, you can attack the state of the actual Wink device. So if you start spamming door open right before you go to work, then that person's probably not gonna be, uh, they, they already have it in their mind that the system's acting up. So if there's another door open notification that happens, say, later that day, when someone's robbing the house, they might think about that less. Now, we discovered during our test that if you spam door closed, occasionally, if the sun's facing the right direction, the wind's right, and the temperature's right, and you know, butterflies are flapping in Japan, um, when you spam the door closed state and you open the door, a notification is never generated if you can overpower that device. So, basically, Robber opens the door, no notification, door still says it's closed, they close the door and now they're inside the house and you're none the wiser. So that's really where uh, you wanna go defense in depth, right? Re don't rely on any one component of your system, they should all be trying to back each other up. So as far, oh, this is all you. Another thing to mention quickly about the wink test that we did is once when you mentioned that it would spoof up the state, it would barely spoof up the state of the app. So if you are that person leaving for work, you open your door, you close it, if, you, if someone's there watching you and can quickly then send another door open and you look at like door open and you look back and the door's closed and you're like, screw it, I'm going to work. If we then break in your home and open the door, it doesn't generate another door open that the person left. So that last door open, it thinks it's open, so it stays there until it gets a door closed on it. So that's another angle of the attack there. Um, this, what we wanted to do, is a little bit of system defense. Basically, we want to protect our systems. We want to know if maybe someone is screwing up the systems themselves, the fun stuff we put in, and we want to try to collect some data during the course of the test. This was a brief thought that mostly started with, I thought this would be fun to put this on the internet and see who screws it. What if someone's already on your network? Why not model a honeypot after an IoT device? And the great thing is IT devices have a small footprint, so you don't have to get too fancy. Uh, what I have at home is an Echo B thermostat, so I decided to model one after that. There's so little information that these things give out. Essentially, if you can have some honeypot that spits back the right MAC address, everything thinks it's really an Echo B, and you can move on with your day. Another angle is something I'm working on and is not even anywhere close to putting up on a GitHub is I thought, well, you know, we have WUDs for collecting probes. Um, there's a lot of these things that can result in a spike of traffic, and we see these attacks. So if we're already collecting Wi-Fi probes, why not do something similar? Um, obviously, I have no creativity to 
theoretical point uh, Jeff has been trying to say. On collecting all traffic and kind of working on ways to make kind of a, a, a historical model of what's usually there, and if it starts seeing anything out of scope, alert on it, because a lot of times these DB stumblers and other stuff are just really, really loud. You're going to see your lights and everything talking and saying hi on through every now and then, but you're not really going to see a lot of traffic, so it's fairly easy to get around that. Another thing is when we were talking about finding devices that you want, either narrowing down what house going to break into or figuring out who's what, it's easy to see Wi-Fi breaks and know what's inside of there. So our thought was, why don't we purposely make the signal intelligence a lot harder on any of them and essentially just start making them really noisy. So easiest one is a Wi-Fi probe, so let's send out a bunch of fake ones. So basically I did with that is I just threw together a Python program that will has a bunch of MAC addresses in it. They're modeled after a lot of home device IoT stuff. And it will just sit there at random times and spit out probes and set up the URSS ID so that it looks realistic. And it just constantly goes. And it, I, I would be confused as hell if I saw it trying to figure out what was going on. And to an extent, our thought with this was the good news is, is again, the average burglar is not going to be going through this. They're not going to know this stuff. They're not going to have the technology. And I would like to think that if there is someone out there that does have that level of knowledge and tech, yes, they could use this stuff. But if I saw something like this, I'd be like, okay, this person's just staring at things. I don't know what else is in that house. I'm not going to break into that guy's home. That doesn't sound like a good idea to me. So we will at least get that up and these slides up and some other stuff up and we'll get that. So another level of distraction was that the signals can get replayed for a lot of these alarm systems. Like we show this at length, and there's a mic off and very similar to Sentry Safe. It's really easy to record these and replay these to get around them. So my thought was, what would be more fun is I can take the stuff that I recorded at Jonathan's house through Link, take it back to my house, and randomly replay that. So if someone's outside of my house thinking I have an alarm, they're seeing stuff like, oh, God, this guy's got this Z-Wave alarm. Okay, he's got this door sensor. He's got a motion sensor that keeps going off. And in reality, none of this stuff existed when I was doing that. You know, and then he could get signals off of my house and do the thing. It's reverse engineering. So uh, the power method of AMR and AMI, could you stupidly play this stuff? Yes. But the problem is, is the school system make it look like you're telling the same team the same method of monitoring power usage to model you. You'd have to spoof out your power going higher and higher. And if then the uh, electric guy drives by right then, your power break gets really shot bad. This could result in your bill being bad. This is very illegal. And it would also be very bad if you did Jonathan's idea of doing this through stuff that's spoofing your worst neighbor's computer and just constantly running that up. That would be very wrong. So an intruder makes the unfortunate mistake of breaking into my trap house. Um, based off all of the automations and integrations that we've set up in the house, it should go into a very defensive state, right? And what happens during that? Off-site collection of data should be pushed more frequently. So you could probably stand a really small micro instance up in AWS or something, and then whenever the it goes into defense mode, start shipping logs over there immediately. The thought with that being is that if this intruder for some reason discovers your platform and disconnects it, that's the brains of your operation, and if he destroys the device, you've suddenly lost all logs. So you definitely want to start shipping that data off immediately. We already touched somewhat on all the different paths of collection that, that you could you could be doing for that, right? So start scanning the waves for any the MAC addresses of any devices that are there. Get the SSID probes for all that in, for all those devices. Get any Bluetooth information. Does he you know if they park the car? Does that car have a radio in it that has a uh, that has Bluetooth? Can we pull that MAC address? Can we pull the device name from it? Can we pull the device name via Bluetooth of the cell phone? Can we, I don't know, use Wi-Fi Pineapple and force them onto a network where we can do more intrusive scans? And that's where we go into more active collection, right? Really active defense. If he makes the mistake of coming into our house and he's broadcasting SSID probes, or let's say he has a cell phone on the AT&T network and we're broadcasting a network called AT&T Wi-Fi, um, not that you would ever do that, and they join that network, then you could go ahead and port scan it, start logging all the traffic, and just try to gain more contextual information about your attacker. Of course, start sending alert notifications to whoever manages the platform or just different members of the house so that you can start to react uh, much more quickly. Um, what, do I, what I have set up is that I have the Wink siren going off, but in addition, all of the Google Home 
turn on, they set their volume to maximum, and then they blast out this really obnoxious leaf siren. And while that's happening, all of the Phillips Hue bulbs are all standing between red and blue lights. And it turns into this like weird police-themed rave. So Robert starts to walk in, motion sensor goes off, and immediately all the lights start flashing red and blue, and you hear sirens. You're either going to be like really freaked out or really intrigued. Either way is good for me. There is that. There is a legal risk associated with that, I suppose. That's what we need, right? No, you could totally do that, though, right? Because what I was thinking was, all right, now I need to, while while the sirens are going on, I'm going to layer in the sound of a shotgun being cocked, right? Or or just some like dogs barking. Any anything you can absolutely do, just to. I mean, you know, don't get swatted. <laughs> so, um. <laughs> so, as far as different ways to, not to notify you, I mean, you know, Home Assistant has really, really simple um, integrations in order to do all that. This is an example of what an email would look like. Hey, you get here, an intruder got detected in your home, and I'll say recording started. Um, I'm a huge fan of pushover because it's stupidly easy to set up and very simple to use. And this is an example of what it would look like on the house. And then you can have, um, you can actually set up callbacks. So if you want to take additional action and you know have it kick off other things, you can do that. And as you can see, it's actually very, very straightforward to set up on the home assistant side. This is an example of just doing it with, uh, doing like generating a, a message with raw curl. And this is an example of what the actual, um, what this notification looks like set up for the home assistant platform. So there's, I mean, there's other ways you can do that too. You could have it do voice calls if you set up an asterisk server. You'll need a zip trunk. There's a ton of different providers available. Um, I think Google Voice is an actual really, really good one, and you can do it for fairly cheap. No, no, you can do it for free actually. Yeah, there's Simonic, five dollars to set up a, a SIP gateway. Very nice to use. And uh, Dave actually wrote a call some, someone say something, which is just a simple script to generate a voice message, call a number and play it. You need, a, you, you need the configured SIP trunk, but let's say that you, oh, I don't know, set up your own Stingray and for some reason this person's device connects to it. While they're inside your house, you just call something, someone say something, call the only phone, call any, all of the phones that have connected to this network, start playing messages to it. And you know, they're getting phone calls while they're inside the house, the lights are going. It just is a confusing situation for everyone involved. And that's the goal, right? So um, there are some offset con considerations as, as the attacker. Um, and as far as like en enhancing the lockdown state of the home, these are just different ways that you can repurpose some of the different devices. If you have a smart thermostat, crank the temperature up. If you're in Florida, or crank the temperature down. Make it unbearable to be inside. If you have smart locks, start spamming lock messages, locked messages and signals to every door in the house, right? So it's not really going to do much. It might waste a few seconds of their time, but that's all precious time that you need in order to start collecting more contextual information off of their devices. Again, if you have speakers, play loud, annoying sirens. Play the sound of a shotgun being rigged. If you have IP cameras, start pushing out constant video to that off-site collection um, server. We had a really nice idea with the, the little tile trackers. They're fairly cheap, but if you throw them in things like vault, um, anything of value, you know, open up your AV receiver, throw one in there, right? And now suddenly you have a way to track individual assets what if they were to leave your property. Um, so as far as host collection, um, you've got all this, this device information, you know, let's say they did break into the house, but it's, you pull it all from the offsite server, you can kind of start to cross-reference all of this information. This really goes to, like, your OSM skills. Um, if they, with all the Wi-Fi probes, cross-reference that with Wiggle. If you don't know what Wiggle is, it's a database where people drive around, collect all of the probes, and tie them to actual GPS coordinates. So looking at all of the different networks that they've connected, you might be able to narrow down their house, cross-reference that with things like voter data, and be able to hand that information over to police. Specific MAC addresses, this is where you kind of start to get a little more interesting. All right, I've narrowed it down to the fact that they could possibly be in these three separate homes. Let's try passing some of these to see if any of these MAC addresses are protected during the intrusion. I'll press this. They could include their name information, especially if they make the mistake of saying, oh, I don't know. Gives me a lot of 
Um, can you constantly have something that's currying out an IP address, right? Start tracking them, continue to track them once they leave, leave the home. So law enforcement is extremely busy, and for the most part, they really don't care about home robbery. True, sorry. But if you make their job really, really easy for them, then you know they have some, they can spend less time doing litigation and more time beating up criminals. Um, so ISPs often use unique SSIDs for home Wi-Fi installs, and that's kind of where Google ties into place, right? If you can find those SSIDs, you can copy and paste that to the ISP, and then you can provide room for anything in the actual address of the nuts. If it's a home, you can see, any, and, and again, this goes back to can you describe by our individual devices present, cross-reference that with any connection that's, that's present inside of the Take all this information. Them do their job. Um, if they would understand it. No, that's, and that's completely true, right? So, really, the pr a, a lot of the burden is definitely going to be on you, but this enables you to do your own self investigation. And the more, in my experience, the more, the more context you can provide to them, the easier it is for them to do their job and the easier it is to track down. So, the, that's, that's pretty much all it is. Dave has. I had a I had a someone break into my brother's home and he stole a uh, a Wii U. He made the mistake of taking the Wii U back to his house and logged into to the to logged in Netflix, which had the IP address, and then cross referenced that and got everything back. That was fun, but that, that's kind of an, uh, you know that kind of tells you a lot about if you could just if you're just collecting this information, you can use that. Insomniac Security. Yes, insomniacsecurity.com. We'll, we'll have that published uh, at some point today. Actually, I'll, I'll probably do that. That really ties in back to the like the whole defense in depth aspect. Yeah, someone might be able to jam one component, but as long as you're layering in as many different things as possible, that's really what you want to go for. Now, that's not being said that as, as attackers, you can't use these exact same techniques that we're doing to smoke screen for yourself, right? So while I'm breaking into a house, hey, I got a Raspberry Pi with a radio inside my pocket that's broadcasting out a whole bunch of junk SSIDs, a whole bunch of you know fake Bluetooth ad addresses. And is that realistic for most attackers? Probably not. But, you know, it's... 
Right, right. You, you got bigger problems with people like that are attacking you. 